The Alco DL109 is one of the most, if not the most, forgotten locomotives in Alcos, and indeed all of American railroad history. It's built as a knee-jerk response to the E and F units of the time, essentially Alco trying to catch up with its competitor. To explore the history of this locomotive, we must first look back at the history of Alco's early diesel production, which began all the way back in 1931. Alco would initially team up with, and then acquire, M&S or Macintosh and Seymour, as it was known formerly, to produce the prime movers or diesel engines for its locomotives. The company would also contract with General Electric Corporation to handle the electronics for these locomotives. These would include the actual traction motors that drove the wheels, as well as the internal electronics to convert the voltages and the generators, as well as the turbochargers at one point. One of the earliest prime movers series produced by Alco was called the 300 series. Named as such because the earliest variation of this prime mover produced 300 horsepower. It would be succeeded by the 531 prime mover, where the tradition of Alco naming its prime movers after the development date would begin. The six-cylinder 531 produced originally around 600 horsepower, but was later boosted to 900 horsepower with the 531T variant. This prime mover would in turn be succeeded by the 538 prime mover, which made 660 horsepower from the start. No turbocharger was included. As far as I can tell, this was due to the fact that the turbochargers were proving somewhat unreliable. A notable quirk of a lot of these early Alco road switchers is that they all feature a high hood, with the exception of the earliest models. This quirk is so notable that many rail fans have taken to referring to them as HHs and then inserting the horsepower rating of said locomotive. The main reason for this unusual but very notable quirk was the fact that the prime mover was designed to sit on top of the frame instead of between the frame rails themselves. This is a common practice done in the automotive industry and would become common practice in the actual locomotive industry. However, at this time, point in time, Alco didn't follow it. This has become a notable and somewhat embarrassing sticking point for Alco's switchers, as the whole concept of a switcher is for it to have great visibility so that the crew can easily be spotted while working around the locomotive itself. This, and in particular the 538's limited horsepower output of 660 horsepower, would become a particular issue as EMD rolled out its own switcher line in 1939 Referred to as the NW2 and making a whopping 1,000 horsepower, it had great visibility because the hood had been dropped in the front of the cab. The prime mover again designed to sit between the rails. The 1,000 horsepower was generated by EMD's new 567 type prime mover, which utilized 12 cylinders without the benefit of turbo or supercharging to produce the horsepower as well as a two-cycle combustion. Alco would come out with a rapid response to the 567 and its 12 cylinders with 1,000 horsepower by developing, again, a development of their existing prime mover called the 539T, short for turbo again, and with its ultimate development, producing a whopping 1,000 horsepower, the same as the EMD product, however, accomplishing this with just six cylinders and turbocharging. As its name implies, the prime mover would begin development in May of 1939 and would be out in time to produce Alco's response to the NW2 and its prime mover, the S1, in June of 1950. The profile of the locomotive, especially from a visibility point of view, was drastically improved, again because the 539 was designed to sit between the frame rails. However, this would dog the prime mover's development from this point on, as it was designed to fit these particular frame rails. Working around this would become a challenge. Also of interesting note, the S1 did not actually include the turbocharged variant of the new 539 prime mover, and so its horsepower was limited to 660, the same as its predecessor running the old 538 prime mover. It would take until August for the S2 to debut, which would finally match the horsepower of GM's MW2 at 1000. 
rough start of this particular locomotive as featured above. The 539Ts were known for being a little rough running like most engines at cold temperatures. The turbo in particular could be troublesome, but once the locomotive heats up, it'll idle as soon as it The S2 would prove a formidable opponent to the NW2, selling 797 units, although the NW2 would still beat it with a total production of 1,145 units. Now if all of this is beginning to sound like corporate one-upmanship, you're pretty much right on, and speci specifically this last chapter where the NW2 was fighting against the S1. This particular development is specifically interesting because Alco, like many of its competitors that produced steam engines of the time, had dismissed the diesel engine as a quote fad and or something that would be dead in a couple years and or a toy. Steam engines would be the real power for the main lines, the real actual haulers, if you will, that would do the jobs. Diesel engines were just a novelty. Fortunately, Alco would quickly realize that steam engines were in fact not the future, but the present and quickly becoming the past of railroad technology, and diesels were the, if not the only, way forward for railroads coming into the future. There are several reasons for this sort of movement taking place in the industry, mainly overhead prices going up due to higher wage rates for employees, as well as shipping rates for cargo, which were again decided upon in Washington with little to no input from the railroads, a still a legacy of the old robber baron tycoons from the previous century as well as commuter rail operations, which railroads had to operate based on a budget in which politicians, which usually didn't understand the business the railroads were involved in, and obviously had a bias towards serving their constituents to enable them to get reelected, would set the budget upon and decide how much railroads could charge. Not a good situation to be in. Needless to say, all of these factors did a number on the railroads company's ability to meet expenses, as the rates didn't necessarily always meet expenses, making the whole situation extremely challenging. And thus, methods like the diesel engine of pulling trains along on the tracks, which cost notably less than steam engines, became very popular very quickly. Needless to say, Alco didn't want to just stay in the switcher market, they also wanted to be in the diesel road market as well. These engines would prove to have a higher profit margin than the switchers as well, making them even more juicy meat for Alco to sink its teeth into. Engines like the EMD FT unit would also go on to sell 550 units, showing that there was most definitely a market, at least for the time, of diesel road locomotives. Alco, ironically enough, would pioneer the road switcher market, which would occur after World War II. Check out my video on the Alco RS1 for more information. Specifically, Alco decided it would follow EMD's lead in terms of road locomotives of a six-axle nature. Alco also wanted to develop the locomotive quick, as in less than a year quick. While the plan of a small company like Alco to build a locomotive of this heft and might at this short notice and this quickly might seem completely out of this world at first here, the fact of the matter is it made perfect sense. The most horsepower Alco could extract from one of its prime movers of the day was 1,000, therefore having a chassis big enough to slip two of these prime movers under, making it even 2,000, made perfect sense. In fact, EMD had such a locomotive, the E3. Although it was not a big seller, it was the same basic concept. Two 567 type prime movers of its own development that created 1,000 horsepower apiece for a total of 2,000 horsepower. The extra heft of the locomotive would also allow Alco to slip any prime mover in place including its older ones, such as the 538, which it would end up doing with a turbocharger. A lack of testing with these prime movers with the turbocharger, specifically the 538, as well as in this sort of heavy application, would prove disastrous for this particular locomotive. The reason for this almost last second substitution of the older prime mover was because the 539T simply wasn't ready for production yet, and Alco wanted to keep its delivery date of December 1939 for the first model. This would prove disastrous, as the prime mover had not been properly tested with the turbocharger and or in this sort of application before. This would be a preview of things to come with this prime mover's successor, the 244. Check out my documentary on the Alco FA for more information. The logic Alco appeared to be utilizing is that bigger locomotives equal bigger profits. Again, a legacy of the steam era.
The body of the locomotive was developed internally from another design and was also rushed. A good example of this is this expansion point where the headlight is on the nose of this locomotive in the shot. Essentially, the body was not wide enough to get around the selected frame, so to adjust for this, it had to be cut apart and this section essentially welded in with the third window in the middle of the engine itself. The naming convention for this locomotive was quite basic. The letters DL stand for diesel locomotive and the number 109 designates the model. Rail fans, however, would come up with several sub-designations for the various different variations of this model. For example, in addition to having the older 538 prime mover with the turbocharger installed, this class of locomotives, again the 103B, featured all electrical accessories such as the fans, wipers, etc. While latter models would be belt driven and or mechanically driven. If there's one thing this class of locomotive, through its various different models all the way up through DL-109, proved, it was that Alco needed to learn a lot about mass production. Consistency was a big issue. For example, DL-103s and 109s had different tractive effort ratings. This was due to them having different prime movers, the 103Bs having the older 538 prime movers, again turbocharged specifically for this application while the 109s got the 539 turbocharged prime movers. Another unfortunate quirk these locomotives would suffer for was the fact that they only had MU cables installed on the rears. This meant that the units could only be MU'd back to back and couldn't have any more than two units put together in a pair. At least two units were rebuilt to allow for multiple M MUing from the front of the locomotives as well. As well. The various different variants of these engines also differed in terms of winterization hatches screens versus directive windows, etc, etc, and several of these would be sent back to Alco to be worked on in Schenectady along their years of life. The outlook for these locomotives looked promising in the initial phases. Unfortunately, that was the initial phases and fate would have other ideas. On December 7th of 1941, the United States was attacked by the Japanese armed forces at Pearl Harbor. This would thrust the country into World War II. The end result of this was the formation of the War Production Board, who would in turn take control of what railroad company ma equipment manufacturers could produce, when, how, and how much. And thus, the DL-109 could not be upgraded beyond a certain point, as the War Production Board had decided that EMD would be the leader in diesel manufacturing, while Alco was to produce switchers and focus on building tanks. There was, however, an exception to this, and it was one of the party pieces built into the DL-109. It was designed for dual service. Railroads like the New Haven Railroad at the time did not like the idea of accepting steam locomotives, nor could they really afford it, as they were awash with commuter traffic, which became ever more in the demand during World War II, as supplies like rubber for tires and gasoline for fuel were becoming ever more difficult to acquire, making commuter trains all the more critical for transportation. Please also note that even if a commuter train is loaded to the brim, it would still lose money due to the regulations on pricing put on by the government. In a stroke of what must be considered extreme luck for the New Haven Railroad and Alco alike, one of the first deliveries of DL-109s arrived at the New Haven Railroad just before the War Production Board's restrictions took effect. This allowed the engines to prove they could do both tasks, passenger and freight. This would th thus allow Alco to petition the government and the War Production Board to let them produce an order of 60 of these engines for the New Haven Railroad as they could qualify as freight engines, not just passenger engines, although the New Haven Railroad would use them as primarily as power for commuter trains. Despite this stroke of extremely good luck for Alco, the locomotive was a complete flop. When it came down to it, the 38 and 39 prime movers just weren't designed for the rigors of a road locomotive, and while they would do fine in switcher duties, both were not refined enough to handle the job, specifically the 38. The 539, while better, had its own problems, for example, rough idling. As mentioned earlier, like most diesel engines of the time, and even to this day, it was a rough runner when cold. However, it also, as it turns out, idled somewhat roughly when warm. This issue was far less pronounced when it was in an application such as a switcher, where only one single prime mover was required. 
And unfortunately for Alco, once two of these prime movers were installed in engines such as the DL109, the vibrations would, would hit off of each other. This could cause the locomotive to shudder violently, even when idling at a station. Turbocharger failures would also become commonplace, as well as electrical problems with the modern electronics that GE or General Electric Corporation had built into these locomotives. The end result, most of these locomotives were out of service by the 1950s. One highly notable exception could be found on the Milwaukee Road, who kept its DL109s running well into the 60s. These units were sent to Alco for a major rebuilding, including the prime mover, electric traction motors, and electrical equipment. These extensive rebuilds occurred during the 1950s. Apparently, the Milwaukee Road was very fond of their particular DL109s. Reportedly, the Milwaukee Road shop mechanics gave number 14A above the nickname Old Maud. As seen by the image above, these particular locomotives even had their noses replaced with an E8 style nose to give them a more modern appearance. A total of 74 cab units plus 4 boosters were built, none of which survive today. All were scrapped. As we can see above, from this point I'm going to be using a model to demonstrate various features of this locomotive. Unfortunately, this is due to the fact that I was unable to find footage of this locomotive with live audio, so please bear with me. Listen closely now as the dual 539 prime movers start one after the other. Not surprisingly, the locomotive sounds much like an early Alco S-style switcher or RS-type locomotive, as it utilizes two of the same type prime movers. Listen closely as the engine throttles up. Now let's hear what those dual turbocharged 539 prime movers sound like at speed. <laughs> 
As we can hear, the Dual 539 Prime Movers have a distinctive sound all their own. Incidentally, this model is a member of the Walters main line of products, and it's again their model DL109. This is again done in HO scale like most of my models. Incidentally, this is the successor to the Lifelike Proto 1000 HO scale DL109. This locomotive is essentially a development of that specific locomotive's tooling, with cross-cut gears, a more refined motor, and a few other tweaks to make it more usable in a modern setting and more reliable. In addition, this locomotive has also been equipped with a select direct decoder from Lok Sound for the sound effects. Speaking of the sound effects, let's hear this locomotive's unique shutdown sequence. The Alco DL109 would be Alco's most spectacular failure to date. Unfortunately, rougher roads were ahead when it introduced its infamous Alco 244 Prime Mover coming up in the 40s. Alco, for understandable reasons, would essentially forget about this locomotive's existence. Alco would go so far as to never use DL as a name for one of its locomotives. DLs would continue to be utilized as the specification numbers for engines, but they would never again be a model name. And that's actually too bad. In addition to the fact that it's a very unique locomotive despite its rarity and unreliability, it could have saved them a lot of trouble with their upcoming 244 Prime Mover and the locomotives it was placed in. Paraphrasing the old saying, one who does not learn from his or her old mistakes is doomed to repeat them over and over again until they do. In the end, the tragedy is, due to this locomotive's short lifespan, and limited production, few rail fans and even Alco fans know the DL109 even existed to this day. And that's going to conclude this video. If you liked it, thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, keep the metal side down.